Good morning. It's lovely to see you all this cold <laughs> Saturday morning. I'm delighted that so many of you were able to come out. And I want to <clears throat> excuse me, thank my co-conveners, Vizira and Ariella, particularly for the fantastic job that, we've, that you've done, that we've done together in putting together this conference. I'm excited to share with you work that I'm just really thinking through um, in connection to the concept of regard. So I'll be talking a little bit about um, visual artist, multimedia African-American visual artist, Alexandria Smith. And hers is the image that you see um, in the first panel of my presentation. In her essay, The Source of Self-Regard, the Nobel Laureate and First Lady of American Letters, whom we just lost, Toni Morrison describes her creative process in the writing of two historical novels, Beloved and Jazz. Most of the essay is focused on Beloved, and particularly on Morrison's effort to make intimate the world historical and centuries-long crime of transatlantic slavery, while at the same time defamiliarizing it. She begins with the story of Margaret Garner, and to capture the wretchedness of, ens of enslavement, fictionalizes the story of the escaped enslaved black woman who, fearing capture and return to slavery, grabbed a saw and cut her child's throat. It is nearly impossible to represent infanticide discursively. The agonies of enslavement are unavailable from this historical vantage. In juridical terms, infanticide amounted merely to the theft of property. It didn't rise to the level of taking a life, of taking the life, of one, the, of taking the life that one had carried and nurtured and loved and needed. To move in the, in the direction of this terrible act, Morrison had to enter imaginatively the psychic and social world of the one who had done it. Morrison describes accessing Margaret Garner via the grammar and the exercise of self-regard. She writes, I'm really looking at self-regard in both racial and gender terms and how that self-regard evolves or flourishes or collapses and under what circumstances. In Beloved, I was interested in what contributed most significantly to a slave woman's self-regard. What was her self-esteem? What value did she place on herself? And I became convinced, and research supported my hunch, my intuition, that it was her identity as a mother, her ability to be and remain exactly what the institution said she was not that was important to her. It is noteworthy that Morrison defines self-regard for the enslaved black woman in two ways. One, in terms of claiming a human identity and capacity, and capacity that had been nullified by the prior claims of property and commerce. And two, in terms of positioning herself in powerful and, mo and meaningful relation to another who is also her own. In other words, Morrison surmises that for enslaved black women and for their daughter descendants, regard, even for the self, is an inherently relational exercise and expression. <laughs> Thinking about regard extends my current critical preoccupation with the interrelation of social abjection and aesthetic abstraction. In my current work more broadly, I attempt to discover and to name aesthetic modes that characterize contemporary black expressive acts and practices oriented toward liberation without a correlative investment in, in inclusive political representation. I ask what experimental literary and visual practices might reveal about the interior of black life worlds and attempt to discern their prescriptions for black thriving in the ongoing catastrophe that, ca that constitutes black life in modernity. My work here proceeds from the premise that the longstanding mandate for racial authenticity as a principal evaluative criterion in black expressive culture has dual components. Racially affirmative representation and the idealization of mimesis as the infusion of political aspiration with an expressive form. In the 21st century, the logics and implications of race have supposedly shifted, yet continued state violences and systemic exclusion expose racism as a lethal apparatus of psychosocial and material asymmetry, superseding the legal remedy of recognition politics. Right, so here the insinuation is that, um, that merely kind of representing through 
creative acts, right, through expressive culture and through cultural production, merely kind of representing black identity, for example, and also presenting black subjects in general as, as aggrieved is not necessarily um, a guarantor that <clears throat> social repair will be made available. And so thus I argue, <clears throat> excuse me, Thus, I argue that mimetic realism reflects the failed discursive promise of black representation in critical political and institutional terms. Is it possible then to regard regard as an aesthetic mode that names a non-realist black feminist expressive practice? And that's really what I'm aiming at. <clears throat> As we all know, <clears throat> excuse me, it's early morning <laughs> and cold. Bear with me, please. As we all know, to be disappeared is a harrowing experience. To feel oneself as distinctly and wholly made as shaped by the accretion of discrete lived moments, as the unique summary of aversions and preferences, and as reflected in a particular disposition or affective universe, fail to register or resonate in the domain of social relations is a violent undoing. <clears throat> the essential harms of containment, of bodily expropriation, of curtailed movement, of inadequate sustenance, of debilitated and weary living, the violences, in other words, that define living in the afterlives of slavery's prescriptive social death haunt every relational instance in which a black person finds herself invalidated and invisibilized. This year's political concepts conference engages the imaginaries, the epistemologies, and the potentialities of retouch, of retouche. It, it attends to the ways the broken, torn apart, deformed, and distorted might be repaired or renewed via a different kind of proximity, a renewed and reformed intimacy, or by being handled anew. My contribution to the shared examination for which we all, are all gathered proceeds from the presumption that the rallying cry of the global movement for black lives, that is, that black lives matter, is or must be both an outward and an intramural address. I argue, moreover, that black life mattering both within and without is a black feminist commitment that shows up in 21st century diasporic expressive practice as something we might think of as regard. Miriam Webster Dictionary defines regard in the following ways. Due consideration, protective interest, the granting or estimation of worth, a feeling of respect or affection. Tra treating black feminism as a radical ethic of being and relating, as the shaping content of black women's collective wisdom across the globe and the ages, and as, the blueprint for the and as a blueprint for a just world, this paper approaches regard as a black feminist aesthetic in new millennial African diasporic expressive culture. It recognizes an increasingly awful present in which climate crisis, fascistic rule, border and border walls, protracted war, voracious capitalism, and the, and the mass warehousing of disposable populations have become commonplace. And it proceeds from the premise that racialized and gendered systems of captivity and control, from the plantation to the checkpoint to the prison, operate through technologies of ubiquitous surveillance, tracking, and capture that isolate and terrorize those who are most marginalized and vulnerable. Building on Bell Hooks' insistence on, on love as radical politics, and Brittany Cooper's principal definition of black feminism of, as black girl friendship. What follows puts into conversation the work of African-American visual artist Alexandria Smith and Somali British poet Warsan Shura to think about the concept, to think about the concept of regard as aesthetic, affective, and relational practice. I do so to emphasize how the emancipatory strategies of communion, of going deep and under in good company, of ecstatic relation, of exuberant black feminist solidarity, give rise to artistic innovation in African diasporic cultural production and establish black feminism's global relevance and resonance in our painful 21st century present. So in November, 
2018, so last November, the first solo exhibit of African-American visual artist Alexandria Smith opened at Boston University Stone Gallery. And I'm gonna just show two, I'm not reading the, 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 these three images that I'm about to show, I'm not reading closely, I just provide them to kind of give an example of what her work is like, or what it looks like, so. So whether presented in collage or as cartoons, the principal figures in Smith's work are little black girls, typically depicted in oversized fragments or a finger pointing, a braid sticking out, an arm reaching. The black girl body in Smith's work is mainly hidden, frequently rearranged and bound within tight symmetrical spaces. It hides or is crammed into corners and closets, half hides or is submerged in water. Like the garroted enslaved like the garroted enslaved girl in Harriet Jacobs' incidents, Smith's little black girls also peek and, po and poke and point. They are, solitary they are painted solitary figures seemingly seeking recognition or rescue. The enmeshed, and again I'm just showing these, the enmeshed materialities of flesh and container in Smith's rendering of broken up black girls rework the relation of flight, rework the relation of fright and relief through the mechanism of anticipated looking. In other words, underlying Smith's isolated fragment in black girls is a comment on the general need of black female and femme subjects for someone's protective interest, or in other words, their need for regard. Smith's recent exhibit in Boston, A Litany for Survival, expands her exploration of black female subjects in search of recognition and rescue. The individual artworks that comprise the installation pursue simultaneously an investigation of Du Boisian double consciousness in black women's subjective development and a celebration of relational practices of black feminine and black feminist communion. Smith's figural abstractions mirror and double and shadow one another. Oversized and bound together in reflexive poses, their bodies angled toward each other and subtly touch. Against blues and blacks and brown and purple canvases, the female blacks of Smith's surreal cartoonish world are never isolated or alone as in her earlier works. In fact, togetherness seems to be the point. The title of the exhibit comes from Audre Lorde's famous poem, A Litany for Survival. The poem, as the title indicates, is a denotation of communal prayer. It is addressed to we, whose lives are marked by precarity, instability, and unexpected brevity. We who are afraid and have internalized fear as a feature of our formation with our mother's milk, Lord writes. We who disavow our desires and mute our own mention. Gathering strength and sustenance from the collective, the poem is told from we to we, and it concludes with a prescription and a mandate for our living. It is better to speak, quote, it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. <clears throat> In mathematics, black life, <clears throat> excuse me. In mathematics, black life, Catherine McKittrick sums up blackness. She describes how blackness structures the economic and sociopolitical systems of existence, semi-existence, and non-existence in racialized modernity. She writes, while the tenets and lingering histories of slavery and colonialism produced modernity as and through blackness, this sense of time, space and in, is, in, is interrupted by a more weighty and seemingly more truthful underside. Where black is naturally malignant and therefore worthy of violation. Where black is violated because black is naturally violent. Where black is naturally less than human and starving to death and violated. Where black is naturally diselected, unsurviving, swallowed up. Where black is same and always and dead and dying. Where black is complex and difficult and too much to bear and violated, end quote. McKittrick captures a historically imposed racial hierarchy so deep and abiding that it has the power to delineate simultaneously subjecthood and its abrogation. She insinuates that modernity's principal promises are a progressive temporal schema perpetually advancing and accretive, and the subject's right to accumulation and increase in and over progressive time. The collective experiences of black people in the West, which include past and present iterations of black captivity, corporeal dispossession, political disenfranchisement, economic abandonment, and social disposability, 
is rooted in a ruthless Euro-American modernity that defines the contours of being, belonging, and becoming in racialized, monetized terms. The modern conception of the subject is ultimately possessive and propertied where being and having and taking collide. Rooted in transatlantic slavery, the conquest and re-territorializing of the globe, and the management or removal of its various popula populations, the subject and the white emerge in modernity at the same time and as the same thing. The black, the imminently killable non-subject, on the other hand, is stuck in stasis, occupying the status of metaphysical negation, always vulnerable to demise or disappearance or to being taken or had. McKittrick invokes the inherent vulnerability of blackness as violated in life and in her language on repeat. This is the condition into which black people are born. Alexandria Smith's The Skin We Speak, Alexandria Smith's The Skin We Speak visualizes black survival as a black feminine pairing. Staging the mirroring that insinuates selfhood or exterior completeness and interior coherence, it depicts two blackened, seemingly female figures under an umbrella or other protective cover. Held within the other's permanent gaze and yet with one eye visibly askance, the figures look at each other while simultaneously looking out for one another. The water that rises to the waist of both figures is suggestive of transatlantic crossings or, displa or displacements, and their mirroring is suggestive of having been found. The figure's intimate touch registers an embrace. The embrace is not, however, a grasping or folding into of arms, which, in their notable absence, insinuates the expropriation of the body's labor, the dispossession of arms and hands. Instead, these figures touch at the breasts, at the sight of feminine beauty and other nurturance. In this piece, the emergence of the black female self depends upon a togetherness that recognizes and nurtures and that speaks in quiet tones of browns and oranges and blacks and blues. I've chosen to analyze the skin we speak because it captures to my mind the promises and the pleasures of black women's friendship, which Brittany, which Brittany Cooper argues is the foundation of black feminism and which I argue is rooted in the intimacy and protective interest of regard. In her recent book, Eloquent Rage, A Black Feminist Discovers Her Superpower, Cooper offers this potent and globally applicable definition of black feminism, notably evacuating it of prescriptive ideologies or predetermined political commitments. Friendship. Friendship with black women is the core essence of what black feminism is about, Cooper argues. Her emphasis on the affective and affiliative dimensions of black feminists, uh, her emphasis on the affective and affiliative dimensions of black feminism highlights its relational capacities and concerns. And it underscores the importance of black girl friendship for black women in the face of other forms of relational failure. She writes, quote, when my patriarchal nuclear fantasy didn't happen and the privileges of, sta of straightness eluded me and a whole generation of overachieving black women, it is my girls who have celebrated my successes, showered me with compliments, taken me out on dates, traveled the world with me, supported me through big life decisions, showed up when disaster struck. One of feminism's biggest failures is its failure to insist that black feminism is first and foremost about truly, deeply, and unapologetically loving, black women, uh, loving women. Cooper lists the many ways her girls show up for her. Fulfilling the presumed mandates of heteropatriarchal coupling, these women draw near to her and create, altern and create alternate intimacies. In moments of achievement, they celebrate her. In moments of doubt, they affirm her. During her meaningful life moments, whether marvelous or ruinous, they arrive and join with her. The gathering of girls is for Cooper simultaneously an intersubjective and social practice that holds black women individually and collectively in a space of regard. In many ways, Cooper describes the regenerative capacities of black women's communion that British Somali poet Warson Shira calls for in her poem, What We Own. What We Own. <clears throat> Our men do not belong to us. Even my own father left one afternoon is not mine. My brother is in prison. <clears throat> Excuse me. My brother is in prison is not mine. My uncles, they go back home and they are shot in the head, are not mine. My cousins stabbed in the street for being two or not enough, are not mine. Then the men we try to love say, we carry too much loss, wear too much black, 
are too heavy to be around, much too sad to love. Then they leave and we mourn them too. Is that what we're here for? To sit at kitchen tables, counting on our fingers the ones who died, those who left and the others who were taken by the police or by drugs or by illness or by other women? It makes no sense. Look at your skin, her mouth, those lips, those eyes. My God, listen to that laugh. The only darkness we should allow into our lives is the night, for even then, we have the moon. From its first line, our men do not belong to us, the poem opens with a lament and a refusal. It decries the social world of black women organized around grief work for failed black patriarchs and gone black men. The poem that is recognizes that the world over, the fragile form and formation of black masculinity can sometimes fail to shape into empowered and entitled solidity. What it becomes instead sometimes is a life without life, a life without living, a life derailed by living death, a life encaged by slowly dying. The poem catalogs the various ways black boys and men leave, whether in Somalia or London, Haiti or Chicago, Black masculine subjects are vulnerable to being stolen, captured, warehoused, shot, taken. Rather than becoming emblems of loss and embodiments of grief, the poem urges black women to disentangle their identities from those who are gone or who go away. Staging at poem's end, a, a woman's gathering in real time, Shiro calls for a celebration of the black female self. Quote, look at your skin, her mouth, these lips, those eyes, my God. Listen to that laugh, she writes. She concludes the poem by encouraging black women to stop grieving what is lost in order to love what remains. Quote, the only darkness we should allow into our lives is the night, for even then we have the moon. So a preoccupation, and this is part of why I'm presenting this work, a, a, a recent, or maybe not so recent, and maybe careers long, <laughs> Preoccupation, if not obsession, that guides this reading is how to define black feminism, um, how to stretch it to, read and to, to reach and to suit black women everywhere, how to evacuate it of unnecessarily prescriptive dogma, how to characterize its ethical commitments, how to theorize the shape it gives to black expressive culture. I'm struck so often by how its invocation seems to engender skepticism among black women from the diaspora. And, and this is really something that's kind of been a, a kind of guiding meditation in my work, is that when I do, and when I have traveled, especially um, to places that are not here, that are not the United States, and even invoke feminism, invoke black feminism, and this is among women of color, Muslim women, there is a kind of skepticism, right? Because of the affiliation, the historical association of thinking through a feminism in relation to imperialist practice, right? In relation to conquest. And so I'm constantly kind of thinking about how to just kind of empty, both empty and broaden um, black feminism, what it might mean in order to kind of renew or to remind us or to make again, to, or to help make again its utility. Right, and so that's part of why almost every time I have an opportunity pre to present, I'm like, you know, kind of th thinking through the question of black feminism in here, the question of black feminism and its practice, I believe, of regard. Um, so I'm struck so often by how his invocation seems to engender skepticism among black women from the diaspora, how often I hear that its precepts and aspirations do not suitably name the ways that black women struggle and strive and survive. Shira's poem offers me a space to think broadly and globally about what black feminism at its most fundamental level is, and, I'm, and I think Cooper is right, an opportunity and the insistence to love and to regard black women. Bell Hooks argues that love is the key to radical black politics. She describes love as the practice of freedom and reminds us that when choosing love, we also choose to live in community. Alexandria Smith's piece, The Incognegros, dramatizes community in glorious choreographed black female movement. <coughs> so again, Alexandria Smith's piece, The Incognegros, dramatizes community in glorious choreographed black female movement modeled after Marcel Duchamp's modernist classic, New Distending a Staircase Number Two, 
Smith's piece depicts four female figures in graded shades of blues, blacks, and grays. And, and, and I want to kind of point out the solitariness and, and the way in which it's one figure or can be looked at red, even though she calls it the incognitos, as one figure, right? And so there's a unity and a multiplicity that registers in this image. So the gradient color palette differentiates the figures, perhaps by region, by class, by period, by complexion. Incognigro most famously refers to racially ambiguous black subjects or those who do not signify blackness in publicly legible ways. The background geometry of brick and steel conveys urban dwelling. The painting visualizes black women becoming themselves in good company of one another. Um, and a, a student, of, of once when I was talking about this image, a student actually called my attention to a, um, a salon scene in, in one of Destiny Child's videos. And so at some point, I'll have to bring in <laughs> that scene into the reading because it's, it's pretty remarkable. I forgot the song now. So the background geometry of brick and steel conveys urban dwelling. The painting visualizes black women becoming themselves in the good company of one another. These women of color perch and step, embodying the rhythm of jazz, the exuberant chatter of the beauty salon. One large eye conveys the work of looking, whether in the mirror or at the world, and thus the consciousness, and thus of consciousness on behalf of the collective. Their bellies slightly protrude, their breasts subtly extend. For black and female subjects, this bodily excess insinuates reproductive labor that implies both amplitude and exhaustion. Even as the figures move synchronously, synchronously across a graphic field, visual field, their movements suggest both merger and emergence. The harm of disregard is a lack of recognition and the inability to resonate within the social domain. The incognito gross has visual, gestural, and oral components that resonate and in such resonance capture black feminine and black feminist solidarity. Of resonance, Imani Perry writes, our own, directly across from me. <laughs> Both technically and metaphorically, resonance is how reverberation moves something or someone else. It is how guitar strings on one guitar respond to the plucking on another as the air between them moves and trembles too. Resonance is not the same as acquisition of knowledge or the repetition or recounting of a shared experience. It is the testimony that makes another tremble as well, that moves you and therefore shapes both feeling and thought. For Perry, resonance creates harmonious stirring. It moves on lower and higher frequencies. It is the barely discernible beat that conjoins and choreographs. In resonance, affect is transmitted below the skin and surface. It is, it is sensation that alters the entire sensorium and finds its, ways to, it finds, its, and finds its way to inner things. Resonance is the gathering of testimony and the promise of witness. I conclude with Warsan Shooter's poem, The Year of Letting Go, as a black feminist reflection on resonance and renewal. The Year of Letting Go. <clears throat> The year of letting go, of understanding loss, grace, of the word no, and also being able to say, you are not kind. The year of humanity, humility, when the whole world couldn't get out of bed. Everyone I've met this year says the same thing. You are so easy to be around. <clears throat> How do you do that? The year I broke open and dug all the rot without, with, my own, with, with my own hands. The year I learned small talk and how to smile at strangers. The year I understood that I am my best when I reach out and ask, do you want to be my friend? The year of sugar everywhere, softness, sweetness, honey, honey. The year of being alone and learning how much I like it. The year of hugging people, I don't know, because I want to know them. The year I made peace and love right here. Shira's poem is about grace, releasing with grace, reforming with grace, resonate, resonating with grace, resonating with grace, restoring with grace. Her literary link, linkage of, human, of humanity and humility suggests that the restoration of humaneness in the ethical sense begins with regard for others, with regard for the world and its features and contents and inhabitants. She opens with the appreciation and the apprehension that things are impermanent, they come and they go. And in that rush of movement, the push and pull of what passes by and passes on, we anchor ourselves in practices of self-regard. The letting go with which the poem begins is made possible by the efficacious use of the word no. There is, much power, there is as much power in refusal as there is in acceptance. The losses the poem invokes are notoriously personal and perilously, are notably personal and perilously collective. This has been a time when the whole world couldn't get out of bed. 
the social malaise or political despair implicate the things that injure our world in the present moment, unabashed and resurgent white nationalism and xenophobia, the wearying of the planet and the obscene hoarding of its resources by so few, the displacement and the de demise of so many vulnerable. The speaker in the poem returns to originary sites of ruin and removes any rot that might remain. She cherishes the self she was given and embraces those she wishes to know. In its meditation on release and renewal, the poem offers ultimately a reconsideration of the time and terrain of black feminist freedom. Freedom is not conceived here as a permanent or necessarily even achievable outcome or state. Rather, it is undertaken in a series of doing. Black feminist freedom is potential, processual, enacted, and always emergent. For grounding the movements and maneuvers of the most aggrieved of black subjects, the, the displaced refugee black girl, Shira demonstrates how black women and girls face regularly the most harrowing circumstances, but with both grace and regard, refuse them nonetheless. Thank you.